Dear students, I welcome you back to the lecture series of course material on transportation engineering 2. So far in the previous lectures we have discussed about the various aspects of railway engineering. Now as our course stands, we will be now shifting our gear and we will be moving into the another component of our course that is airport engineering. Now onwards whatever lectures will be delivered, they will be delivered with respect to the various aspects of airport engineering as we have seen in the railway engineering. We will be looking at the aspects related to the aircrafts, the airports, the design features of the airports, the terminal buildings and the various associated features of the terminal buildings and likewise. In today's lecture, it is totally related to the introduction of air transport in the world and in India and then we will be having some more features and the, this particular lecture has been outlined in the form like the air transport, its importance, the development of air transport, the national and international organizations which are involved in air transport, the objectives of organizations like ICAO etc. and airport classification. Starting with air transportation, air transportation is uh, one way of uh, one system of transportation which tries to improve the accessibility to otherwise inaccessible areas. Uh, what we have seen so far is that we have uh, read about the highways or the roads, we have then read about uh, in this lecture series on railways, where railways is one another system which provides accessibility to certain remote areas like especially in the case of the mountainous region. But still there may be some more areas which, which do not have the accessibility in terms of the connectivity by road or by rail and that is where the air transportation comes into picture. It provides a continuous connectivity over land and water therefore there is no requirement of changing of the equipment as in the case of the other equipments like we are using uh, the road transport and then when the land is not no more we cannot use the road transport and we have to use uh, the water transport system. Now, this may be for the inter country system or intercontinental system or it may be within the city itself like Goa or uh, like uh, in some parts of Kerala where as soon as the road ends then we provide a water connectivity in terms of ferries and uh, the whole of the vehicle is being transported by using that ferry to the other side of the water body and again the road is used. So, uh, it means there is a change of equipment in this type of a scenario whereas, if we are having air transportation same then there is no such uh, change of equipment and it is a continuous connectivity. Another thing is related to the emergency conditions. In the case of emergency conditions, air transportation is the best way which can provide the relief and uh, uh, that is what we have seen in the case of uh, the flooding conditions where uh, we just uh, drop the food packets or the uh, medical uh, boxes which are required in that area at that point of a time and similar conditions may be there where the air transportation may have uh, uh, better requirement or better it may have proved to be a better system as compared to the other systems. Then because of its speed, it uh, saves the productive time and uh, there is no loss of the this part, uh, type of a productive time in the journey that is another specific advantage especially uh, for those where the time is having a much value. Then it increases the demand of a specialized technical skill workforce as we know that uh, air transportation is uh, um, mostly dependent on the electronic gadgets and therefore, this is a more technical in the sense of the workforce as compared to the other systems. Therefore, it is uh, as soon as the air transportation facilities are provided in any area, we are, that means we are increasing the demand for the technical is, is skilled workforce. It also adds to the foreign reserve that is uh, another added advantage of air transportation because uh, it helps in improving the tourism facilities and if there is a flow from outside then that will add to the reserve uh, for the country. Further, uh, there are some 
problems to uh, associated with the air transportation system that because uh, uh, for its setting up of in any area it requires heavy funds. And uh, these heavy funds are continuously required, it is not that uh, uh, these funds are required only at the time of uh, the provision of the facilities, but at the time of its operation as well as its maintenance the continuous flow of funds has to be made then only the system can be maintained. Then operations are highly dependent on the weather conditions as you must have seen uh, nowadays also or uh, you must have also seen in the previous uh, conditions when there was winter and there are the news uh, coming on that is uh, there is the delay to the flight or there are some flights which have been cancelled because of flooding conditions like in Gujarat or in Mumbai or other parts of the country. Uh, so, that is what happens is that this is more dependent on weather conditions as compared to the other modes of transportation that is the road based transportation or the rail based transportation. Further, it requires highly sophisticated machinery and uh, without that uh, it cannot be operated, it cannot be uh, safely and efficiently uh, operated on all the routes whatever has been provided. It adds to the outward flow of foreign exchange in terms of uh, getting the know-how uh, related to these highly sophisticated machinery or uh, the other way of looking at this aspect is that uh, we have to purchase uh, the big aircrafts from outside and uh, that is uh, uh, one thing uh, which creates the outward flow of the foreign exchange. Safety provisions is one of the biggest problems in air transportation because uh, there is no uh, supporting system which is being provided while the aircraft is in air. Therefore, in that condition if there is any thing wrong happens to the flying aircraft then the biggest problem is it's the safety of the passengers or the freight which is being transported by that aircraft. So, uh, that is uh, one of the biggest area of concern. Then a specific demarcation of flight paths and territories is essential so that uh, there is no overlap of the flight paths or there is no crossing of the flight paths at the same altitude which may otherwise cause uh, an accident because the aircrafts which are moving on those flight paths like in the case of railway tracks uh, if there is any crossing then the pilot will not be able to uh, be knowing about those crossings at those particular uh, altitudes and uh, if any aircraft comes from the other path then it will just uh, get uh, resolved into the accident and this has happened in the past uh, especially somewhere in Yugoslavia where the two aircraft which are coming from the different flight paths and uh, the flight paths were crossing and uh, both the pilots could not understand and they were not having the information regarding that movement and finally, the aircrafts collided in the air itself killing all the persons on board. So, that is why it is very important to demarcate the flight paths and territories if this is not done then this is going to be a very big safety hazard in this operation. Now, we will look at the development of air transport in the world, how the air transport has uh, kept on developing. Uh, that was the 1903 when uh, the first successful flight was made by Wilbur and Orville Wright and that was in Kitty Hawk of uh, North Carolina. This was can be, this is being uh, taken as the first flight successful flight by air vehicle that is the aircraft which was made by these two brothers. Then in 1909 uh, a French pilot named Louis uh, Valroit uh, crossed the Ign English channel to England that was from France towards the English England side. So, this was uh, after 6 years of the first uh, successful flight. Then in 1911 the post was carried that is uh, the uh, postage was carried by the air in India from Allahabad to Nani that was the first time an aircraft was uh, operated in India also and uh, that was in Allahabad and uh, Nani is just the outskirts of Allahabad. So, between Nani and Allahabad that is uh, crossing uh, Ganga uh, that is uh, 
was the first flight which was done. What we can see is that uh, just in a span of 8 years after that, we had the flight in India. So, probably we were the one of the first who has operated these air transport flights and the pilot was Henry Peckwit. Then 1912, the flight between Delhi and Karachi was operated. Then 1914, air passenger transport begin in Germany, that is after India. And uh, 1918, the first international service uh, between France and Spain was operated. 1919, London Paris flight was uh, inaugurated. Then 1919, the International Commission on Air Navigation was uh, established, that is uh, abbreviated as ICAN, and it was for the movement of the air transport. So, as to look at uh, the number of air transport vehicles which are, were coming up by that time and it was felt to have that type of a commission to control it. Then further in 1919, the six European airlines formed uh, one association that was named as International Air Traffic Association IATA and that was formed in Hague and this was again another effort so as to control the movement of uh, the aircrafts by different airlines and to have a coordinated approach which is beneficial for all. It was mainly uh, having a concern or objective of the airlines as compared to the uh, countries or as compared to the passengers. Then in 1928, there was a Havana Convention on Civil Aviation and uh, this Havana Convention on Civil Aviation transformed into another convention in 1929, which was Warsaw Convention on Civil Aviation and the effect of these type of conventions. Uh, was uh, that uh, slowly we had a major body of air transport and that we will look at. But between that in 1930, there was uh, one flight which was round the world flight which operated. Then 1944 saw the setting up of International Civil Aviation Conference. Uh, this was one conference which finally culminated into a body and uh, this body with the Chicago Convention and all was uh, finally established into a called provisional form of ICAO, that is International Civil Aviation Organization, a body which internationally controls the overall movement of uh, civil aviation, not uh, related to the military aviation, uh, the civil aviation operations throughout the world. So that uh, there, there is a coordinated effort between all of the countries to provide such connectivities. In 1945, International Air Transport Association IATA was established in meeting at Havana, Cuba that was uh, finally it was uh, succeededly established. In 1947, the International Civil Aviation Organization was established as a body of United Nations. So, it became a body of United Nations, whereas initially only the participating uh, states, only participating countries in the conference. Uh, they basically agreed so as to establish the International uh, Civil Aviation Organization, but then in 47 after 3 years, it was incorporated as one part of United Nations. Then uh, in 20, on 27th July 1949, the world's first jet airline, the D Havilland DH-106 Comet 1, it made its first flight from uh, Hatfield Airport just north of London and it was piloted by Captain John Coningham to an altitude of uh, 8000 feet. So, that was the first uh, jet airline flight in 1949. Then in 1954 saw uh, the first one of coming from the Boeing that was Boeing-80 prototype B707 and it made the first flight. So, this was the first Boeing which was uh, uh, manufactured by the Boeing company. Then in 1969, Concorde was uh, having its first flight, it is uh, one of the peculiar and design was there of this Concorde which was more aerodynamic and uh, it has a cutting edge in terms of the speed also. Then in 1969, Boeing also came out with another uh, uh, model of a Boeing that was named as B747-100 because within the 747 category, then they had uh, manufactured some more type of models. So, that was the 100 which fly in 1969. 
Then coming to 1988, there was Airbus A320 and uh, this Airbus A320 was fly by wire. That means uh, it was possible to control it by uh, the remote form and that entered into the service. And now in 2006, what we have seen is that uh, there, there is an Airbus which has come up and this is A328 which has taken its maiden flight and uh, it also came to India and we will be looking at its uh, dimensions etc. when we will discuss about the various type of aircrafts. But uh, this is one of the biggest passenger aircraft which is being uh, manufactured so far by uh, any of the manufacturing agencies like Boeing or Airbus and uh, it can seat up to like 800 persons in one vehicle that is the aircraft. Now we come to the development of air transport in India. Uh, in this case in 1911 that was uh, the post was carried by air in India from Allahabad to Nani as we have already uh, discussed that the pilot was Henry Peckwit. Then 1912 there was a flight between Delhi and uh, Karachi. Then 1927 a civil aviation department was established so as to control the flights from different places. 1929 there was a regular air service between Karachi and Delhi. Then in 1932 Tata Airways Limited was set up that was uh, the private airways. 1933 the Indian Transcontinental Airways Limited was formed so as to provide the connectivity between the continents. Then in 1938 by the end of the year 153 aircraft were registered in India by that time. In uh, 1946 the Air Transport Licensing Board was established because number of companies were coming up and they were having a large number of uh, size of the fleet. 1947 Tata Airways changed its name to Air India Limited. So the Air India Limited which now is being operated that was basically started by Tata it was Tata Airways. In 1948, Air India International Limited was established by the government. In 1953, Air Transport Corporation Bill was made, uh, made a provision for establishing two corporations, one for the domestic services and other for the international services. So that uh, this is the point at which uh, we came out with the division between the international and domestic services. In 1972, the International uh, Airport Authority of India that is IAAI was set up so as to uh, coordinate the international aviation from different locations of the country and suggest the measures by which we can operate or uh, we can provide such facilities. In 1981, Vyodhu service was started and later it merged in Indian Airlines in 1993. Then in 1985, there was an air taxi policy. It was announced that at that point in time, in 1994, Airport Authority of India was formed by merging International Airport Authority of India and National Airports Authority. So these two agencies which were separately working, they were merged together and AAI was formed. And this is what is working now. Uh, now we come uh, to the different type of agencies. Uh, as we know that we started discussing about the agencies, the setting up of the agency which later on became the part of United Nations in 1947 that was uh, International Civil Aviation Organization in short termed as ICAO. Uh, then this is uh, the site of uh, this agency www.ico.int. The other one is the Federal Aviation Administration being run in United States and uh, this is another big agency which is uh, working in the area of provision of air transport facilities and making rules and regulations related to that and that is uh, the site for this one is www.faa.gov. Then uh, there is Airports Authority of India which is controlling the air navigation in India and it is www.air portsindia.org.in. Then we have Air India International Corporation which looks to, uh, to
towards the international connectivities by Air India and it is uh, uh, www.airindia.com. Then there is an Indian Airlines Corporation which is www.indian-airlines.nic.in that is the site for this one. And then there are a number of private air transport agencies like uh, Jet Airways, Sahara Airways, Go Airways uh, or Indigo and likewise. So, they have their own sites uh, which can be looked at. Uh, out of these agencies, some of the important agencies we will be looking at and we will try to look what, what are the objectives for which those agencies were set up and how they work. Uh, we will start with the first one and the most important one which is uh, globally controlling the overall civil aviation and that is International Civil Aviation Organization. This was established in 1944 as a result of Chicago Convention, this is already we have seen. Its headquarter is in Montreal, Canada and this organization is made up of uh, uh, three constituent parts. One is an assembly, a council of limited membership with various subordinate bodies and a secretariat. The assembly com is composed of representatives from all contracting states and is the sovereign body of uh, ICAO. Whereas, the council is the governing body which is elected by the assembly for a three year term and it is composed of 36 states. So out of the total of members of countries uh, which are there as a member of ICAO, we, these 36 are elected to the council for a three year term. And the secretariat is headed by a secretary general and is divided into five main divisions and the divisions are the Air Navigation Bureau, the Air Transport Bureau, the Technical Cooperation Bureau, the Legal Bureau and the Bureau of Administration and Services. So, this is how it is being divided and this is this works with the help of all these bureau. Further, the aims and objectives of ICUs are uh, to develop the principles and techniques of international air navigation and to foster the planning and development of international air transport so as to ensure the safe and orderly growth of international civil aviation throughout the world that is the one important thing and encourage the art of aircraft design and operation for peaceful purposes uh, that is related towards the manufacturing units. Encourage the development of airways, airports and air navigation facilities for international civil aviation that is for the providing the connectivity between nations and continents, meet the needs of the people of the world for safe, regular, efficient and economical air transport means uh, try to make this facility to be a mass based facility as far as possible. Further, uh, so as to prevent economic waste caused by unreasonable competition that is the controlling factor between the different airlines or the different countries or the private airlines which are operating at international level. So, that unreasonable competition should not uh, result into a waste. So, the economics has to be dealt up. Then ensure that the rights of contracting states are fully respected and that every contracting state has a fair opportunity to operate international airlines. So, that is again another controlling and coordinating factor between the different uh, member countries or the member airlines of this organization and uh, avoid discrimination between contracting states that is there should not be a bias as far as the movements are concerned in air and provision of facilities are concerned and the use of those facilities is concerned. Promote safety of flight in international air navigation, promote generally the development of all aspects of international civil aeronautics that these are the aims and objectives of ICAO. And this organization has established uh, some strategic objectives for a period that 5 year times time period of the 2005 to 2010 and they are as follows safety to enhance the global civil aviation safety, the security and hence global civil aviation security environmental protection that is minimize the adverse effects of global civil aviation on the environment, efficiency so as to enhance the efficiency of uh, aviation operations, continuity to maintain the continuity of aviation operations, 
and the rule of the law that is a strengthened law governing international civil aviation. So, these are the uh, points which it is giving more stress in the, this period which is going on starting 2005 and ending 2010. Then coming to the another important agency which is working in the area of uh, civil aviation design uh, operation and maintenance is the Federal Aviation Administration. This Federal Aviation Administration is a US body and it was uh, initially known as the Federal Aviation Agency and there are number of functions which is performing like uh, it encourages the establishment of civil airways, landing areas and other air facilities. It designates federal airways and acquires, establishes, operates and conducts research and development and maintains air navigation facilities along such airways. So, it is completely involved in the all of the processes which are required for the provision of facilities is starting from its planning to its execution and implementation. So, means whatever aspects are there, it tries to provide its guidelines on all those aspects. It makes provision for the control and protection of air traffic moving in air commerce. That is uh, obviously, wherever the aviation agencies are there, they always look to control and protect the system and provides for aircraft registration that is uh, the registration within the country that is US not outside. Then uh, there are some more functions of this one is that it undertakes or supervises technical development work in the field of aeronautics and the development of aeronautical facilities. So, that is uh, uh, towards uh, the other side of uh, the air transport. It is not exactly the passenger air navigation, but uh, it is talking about the aeronautic conditions in terms of uh, the profiles and in terms of provision of facilities towards the space also. Then it pr prescribes and enforces the civil air regulations for safety standards and it includes the effectuation of uh, safety standards, rules and regulations, the examination, inspection or rating of pilots and other flight personnel, aircraft engines, air navigation facilities, aircraft and air agencies again in US, issuance of various types of safety certificates again in US. Then it also requires notice and issues orders with respect to hazards to air commerce and it issues airport uh, operating certificates to airport services servicing air carriers. So, these are some of the things which are being done at by FAA in US and uh, many of its guidelines which have been given in the area of planning, designing, maintenance and operation of facilities are there have been used by other agencies uh, throughout the world because uh, uh, most of the agencies are not having the R&D facilities available to them. Now, in India we have uh, the airport authority of India and this airport authority of India is uh, controlling the overall air navigation here and uh, this airport authority of India was constituted by an act of parliament and it came into being on 1st April 1995 and uh, that was made possible by merging uh, the two agencies which were working at that point of a time at the national and international level that was the national airports authority and then the international airport authority of India. Then this AAI that is Airport Authority of India manages 126 airports in the country and out of these 126 airports 11 are of international category that is they are providing the international flights, 89 are domestic and 26 are civil enclaves uh, which are basically the defense airfields but can also be used for passenger traffic movements. The international airports are at Ahmedabad. Amritsar, Bangalore, Goa, Guwahati, Hyderabad, uh, CIL Private, Mumbai, Delhi, Calcutta, Chennai and through Anantpuram. Then uh, there are certain functions which uh, AAI is uh, looking at. Uh, they are the control and management of Indian airspace extending beyond the territorial limits of the country as accepted by ICAO means it is working in coordination with ICAO and it looks and controls and manages the overall airspace being provided to uh, the India. 
then design, development, operation and maintenance of international and domestic airports and civil enclaves, construction, modification and management of passenger terminals, development and management of cargo terminals at international and domestic airports. So, these are the, some of the functions continuing with that. Uh, there is a provision of passenger facilities and information systems at passenger terminals of the airports, expansion and strengthening of operation area, which runways, air aprons, taxiways, etcetera, which are the features of the geometrics or the facilities to be provided on airports, the provision of visual aids for a safe uh, navigation of uh, the aircrafts on the airports and the provision of communication and navigational aids with ILS, DEVO, DME, radar, etcetera, the various uh, equipments, electronic gadgets which are needed for uh, the safe or efficient movement again for aircrafts. Now, uh, this is the symbol of uh, Airport Authority of India, Suraksha Sahit Seva. Uh, now, we look at another airport agency uh, in India that is uh, Director General of Civil Aviation. And this Director General of Civil Aviation is uh, basically an attached office of Ministry of Civil Aviation. And uh, this is the regulating body in the field of civil aviation primarily dealing with safety issues. The headquarters are located in New Delhi with regional offices being provided in different parts of the country that is India. There are 14 regional airworthiness offices, 5 regional air safety offices the Regional Research and Development Office that is uh, RRDO and uh, that is uh, located at Bangalore and the Gliding Center uh, at Pune. Then uh, there are some of uh, responsibilities and functions are there of the Director General of Civil Aviation like uh, it is a statutory uh, authority responsible for laying down standards and their implementation which covers airworthiness safety and operation of aircraft, flight crew standards and training, air transport operations. Then the another thing is the licensing of uh, flight crew aircraft engineers and civil aerodromes, the certification of aircraft operators. Uh, like some of the things which we can see is that uh, they are synonymous of the functions of the responsibilities which we have seen in FAA. Then uh, further it uh, has the responsibility of investigation into incidents and minor accidents, regulation and control of air transport operations, formulation of uh, aviation legislation, research and development activities in the field of civil aviation, handling of matters relating to ICAO, advising to government on policy matters and supervision of training activities of flying or guiding clubs. So, these are different responsibilities and functions with which it is working. Now, another agency which is uh, uh, providing the operational facilities in India, uh, basically the previous uh, agencies which we have seen, the two agencies like AAI and Director General of uh, Control of Air Navigation in India, they are the administrative sort of agencies which are trying to provide the guidelines and controlling the overall system. Uh, Indian Airlines Corporation, which is now named as Indian, uh, is uh, the operational wing of the same and it came into being in 1953 with the enactment of Air Corporation Act and it is providing air transportation within the country as well as to some of the neighboring countries and uh, it started after merging uh, 8 private airlines which were operating at that point of a time. At the time of nationalization, Indian Airlines inherited a fleet of 99 aircraft. So, that was it started with 99 aircraft at that point of a time, which came from the 8 private airlines. Between 1970 and 1982, Indian Airlines started inducting its first batch of white bodied Airbus and that was A320 aircraft. So, this A320 aircraft was inducted between 70 and 82. Then uh, it, uh, its latest acquisition is uh, Airbus A319, which was inducted in December 2005. This is another Airbus which they have purchased and is operating uh, with Indian Airlines Corporation. 
It has also placed orders for 43 new aircraft uh, out of which 19 are of category A319s, 4 are A320s and 21 are A321s. These are the numbers of the Airbuses. A stands for Airbus and if it is a B condition then it stands for Boeing's. Uh, generally Boeing's are having a well, uh, numbers like 7 something or so. The first aircraft is already supplied to Indian Airlines out of these. It covers 76 destinations, 58 within India and 18 abroad. Uh, this is uh, the new design of uh, Indian Airlines that is uh, Indian and with the uh, logo of uh, the sun and they have used a color on the fuselage also as well as uh, the these are the engines and these engines are also being colored with the same logo as being provided on the tail. Now, another agency which is working in India is the Air India Corporation. This Air India Corporation uh, uh, came in with the, the formation of basically a private airline by Tata that was Tata Airlines uh, formed by Tata Sons Limited. And then October 15, 1932 a light single engine postmouth uh, took off from Karachi on its flight to Mumbai uh, that is Bombay via Ahmedabad that was the first flight was being made by this Tata Airlines uh, flight. Tata Airlines were converted into a public limited company on July 29, 1946 and it was renamed as Air India. Air India International which was registered on March 8, 1948, it inaugurated its international operations modestly with a weekly service from Mumbai to London via Cary. Uh, Cairo and uh, Geneva on June 8, 1948. So, that was the first flight being provided. Then uh, the first Boeing 707 was received in February 1960 by Air India Corporation. The word international was dropped in 1962 and it became all jet carrier corporate all jet carrier agency that is all the aircrafts which were available with Air India were of jet category. Then in 1970 Air India moved to its present Air India building at Naribun Point. Then uh, arrival of the first Boeing was in 1971 that was 747-237B. 747 is the trade benchmark and 237B is the subcategory within this 747. Formation of Hotel Corporation of India Limited and uh, Air India Charters Limited in 1971. So, the Air India is also operating its own hotels that is known as the Hotel Corporation of India and uh, then the 747 simulator was installed at Bombay in 1972 because in our there was arrival of Boeing 747 with respect to that the simulator was installed so that the pilots can be given training on this one and that is how they can operate 747 in India. Then Air India's first hotel Centur was opened in the Bombay in 1972 that was under Hotel Corporation of India Limited. Then a real time computer system was installed in Bombay in 1979 again with respect to uh, providing the pilots an atmosphere and environment in which they can understand the complexities of uh, air transportation. The new international airport terminal was opened at Bombay in 1980. Then a computerized passenger reservation system was introduced in Bombay in 1981. Then Air India purchased three Airbuses A300 B4s in 1982. That was the enhancing of the capacity of uh, uh, the passenger load which was available with Air India at that time. In the second phase 6 A310 300s were ordered in 1985 for induction into the fleet in, by 1986. Then uh, Indira Gandhi International Terminal was opened at Delhi Airport in 1986. Then computerized departure system was installed at Bombay in 1986. Then Boeing 707 was withdrawn from the services that was the first Boeing which was purchased and which was uh, made even by the Boeing company 
and that was the first uh, jet plan which was which came to the services with Air India also. So, that was taken out of its service in 1986. Then uh, the Airbus 310 300 was delivered in 1987 by the Airbus company. The airline acquired two more Boeing 747-300 Combi. Combi is the name which is given because it can handle both the passengers and the cargo. So, uh, if it is only mainly handling the passengers, then it is different category than if it is mainly handling the cargo, then it is different category. And this was uh, acquired in 1988. Then uh, it introduces IATA currency system and the new identity logo Sun on tail and fuselage in 1989. Then there was Di Diamond Jubilee in 1992 and uh, effective March 1, 1994. The airline has been renamed as Air India Limited. Then four Boeing 747-400s were in, inducted into the fleet between August 1993 and July 94. Then two more are inducted in 96. That is how it is continuously increasing its uh, traffic handling capacity. And uh, now uh, further there are B 747-400s and 9 air buses and that is 300 tons have been inducted on dry lease in the flight in the recent months only. And this is the logo of Air India Corporation, the Maharaja. Now we come to the classification of airports. The classification of airports has been given by the different agencies which are working in the area of uh, uh, providing the guidelines for planning, design, maintenance and operation of the facilities or the construction of the facilities. The main two organizations which are being working in this area are uh, ICAO and FAA and therefore, the classifications or the other guidelines are coming from these two organizations only. Now, within these airport classification systems, uh, the one way of classifying the airport is on the basis of uh, takeoff and landing. Takeoff and landing means that aircraft is moving uh, from the runway into the air and landing means it is coming from air and it is uh, moving on the land now. So, on the basis of the distances being provided for taking uh, off or for landing on the runway strip, uh, we can classify the airports. Uh, in this category, the conventional takeoff and landing airports are there where the runway length is uh, more than 1500 meters. Then there are reduced takeoff and landing airports that is RTOL and this is uh, CTOL in short conventional takeoff and landing that is CTO and L whereas the reduced takeoff and landing is RTOL. And in this airport uh, condition, the runway length varies between 1000 and 1500 meters. Whereas, there is a S toll that is short takeoff and landing airport where the runway length is 500 to 1000 meters. And then there is a V toll that is a vertical takeoff and landing airports where the operational area is defined in terms of square meters and that is 25 to 50 square meters generally used for the operation of helicopters. Then based of geometric design, uh, ICAO classification system if we take then it employs aerodrome reference code and it consists of two things. One is the length of the runway available where it is classified using the code number uh, ranging from 1 to 3, 4 and uh, the aircraft wing span and outer main gear wheel span. These are other two uh, characteristics which they use and these in based on these things it is being classified using letters A through E. Uh, we look at uh, uh, based on the length of the runway then uh, we have the code number and the basic runway length. The code number if it is 1 then the basic runway length is less than 800 meters. If it is 2 then it is 800 meters and up to but not including 1200 meters. If it is 3 then it is 1200 meters up to but not including 1800 meters and the fourth category is 1800 meters and over. So, that is the uh, classification of the airports on the basis of length of runway being provided uh, on the basis of guidelines given by ICAO. Uh, then further uh, we have the classification on the basis of wing span and outer main gear wheel span 
and here we have again the code letters uh, which are uh, in the form of A, B, C, D and we have the wing span and outer main gear span. Uh, in the case of category A, it is uh, up to but not including 15 meters whereas wing span is up to but not including 0 0.5 meters. Then for B, it is uh, 15 meters up to but not including 24 meters and uh, 0.5 meter and up to but not including 6 meters in the case of outer main gear wheel span. Then C is the other category which is for 24 meter up to um, but including 36 meters that is what we see is that the span of the wing span is in keep on increasing like this and that is why we require that means we are talking about a bigger aircraft and with respect to that we require a higher runway length. And here it is uh, outer main gear wheel span is uh, 6 meters up to but not including 9 meters and in case of D it is uh, 36 meters up to but not including 52 meters for the wing span and for uh, gear span it is 9 meters up to but not including 14 meters. Uh, then the E category is there where it is 52 meters up to but not including 65 meters for the wing span and for the gear span it is 9 meter up to but not including 14 meters. Uh, now we come to another classification system of the airports which is being given by FAA that is the Federal Aviation uh, Administration and here uh, it is talking in terms of the aircraft approach speed which is generally given in knots and uh, 1 knot is equivalent to 1.9 kilometer per hour speed. So, here if we take in that form then the approach speed and uh, approach category and the approach speed in knots then uh, category A is for less than 91 knots, category B is for 91 to 120 knots, category C is from 121 to 140 knots and category D is from 141 to 165 knots and category E is for 166 or greater knots. So, that is one way of classification by FAA. Then based on function also we can classify and uh, uh, we can classify the airports in terms of the civil aviation airports and within that civil aviation airports again the classification can be on the basis of the type of the uh, facilities or the type of the flights being provided that is uh, whether the flights are being provided at the international level con providing the connectivity between the countries uh, or the continents then that is the international civil aviation or on the basis of the flights which have been provided within a country that is what is known as the domestic civil aviation. So, on the basis of function we can have international and domestic civil aviation airports that means there are some airports which may be providing only the domestic flights but then there can be other airports which are providing either the international flights only or a combination of international and domestic flights may be there depending whether they have that size by which we can segregate the two types of the flights within the same airport. Then there is another aviation that is military aviation which is uh, related to the military or the strategic needs of uh, uh, protecting a country and providing the strategic weapon in terms of uh, the striking area from where the aviation or the our army in the uh, can provide uh, that teeth by which they can defeat the uh, enemy. So, that is the total dependent on the military aviation conditions, but then is still whatever uh, uh, such type of uh, airports are being provided there is always a possibility that if required then the passenger flights can also be uh, provided or those airports. So, therefore, they may be of a military as well as the passenger conditions and slowly uh, we have to come to this condition uh, this type of a scenario where the military airports will also be used for uh, the passenger airports still there is an emergency at what time uh, we can use them only for military purposes. Then we come to the aerodromes being provided in India the classification of all those aerodromes in India. Uh, in the case of India we have the international hubs, hubs uh, means uh, 
the locations from where the connectivities to different directions are provided. And in this category, uh, we include the airports which are currently classified as uh, international airports and which are having the facilities of uh, world class standards. Uh, at present, uh, this would cover only some of uh, the international airports out of the 11 international airports which are available or have been named in India, which we have already seen and uh, uh, they are Mumbai, Chennai, Calcutta and uh, Tiruvananthapuram. These are the four uh, such airports which are providing the international flights and at the same time which can also be termed as international hubs because they are mostly being used by the large number of uh, airlines of the world and uh, they also provide the connectivity from one part of the world to the another part of the world. So, that is what is the function of any hub. Then further, there can be the regional hubs and uh, in the case of regional hubs, uh, they have to act as uh, uh, operational basis for uh, regional airlines and also uh, they have all the facilities which are currently postulated for modal airports, including the capability to handle limited international traffic if it is required so. So, that is uh, the case of uh, the step 2 condition within the aerodromes in India that is after international hubs, we can have the regional hubs. So, uh, what we can say is that some of the major airports plus uh, the other airports which have been listed as international airports in India, they are basically working as the regional hubs uh, providing connectivities to certain countries, not all the countries as such. Then further, uh, we have the another category that is the domestic airport category and uh, in the case of domestic airport category again we have uh, the further three categories by which we can divide all these domestic airports. What we found is that uh, there are certain airports which have been defined as a model airport like uh, uh, they have been developed in that way so that they can be enumerated by, by the other airports which are being coming up in the neighboring areas or the regions. So, that is how they have been defined and uh, some of the examples of uh, this category are uh, the airport being provided at uh, Indore, Nagpur, Vadodara, Bhuvneshwar, Imphal, etc. Whereas, uh, there are some more airports which are operational in nature in the sense that any time they can be operated without uh, uh, waiting for some modifications to be done at uh, that location. So, that is the category which is termed as operational airports. So, there is a some uh, personals being provided by AAI which are controlled by AAI or the regional hubs they are stationed there, they maintain the facilities and as and when it is required, then these airport strips or airports are made operational. So, examples in this category are like Udaipur, Kota, Kanpur, Cochin, etcetera. And the third category within the domestic airports is the non-operational category, uh, where the airports have been provided, but they are in such a condition so that they cannot be operated at uh, uh, at any point of a time in a sense that as soon as the there is a requirement, we cannot directly operate an air, air, aircraft on that one. So, it requires uh, some improvements in the form of uh, uplift, uh, providing uh, better facilities on runways or taxiways or aprons or maybe the controlling systems being provided at that location. Uh, the air strips which are available, but which are not under the operation. Uh, some of the examples for that are like uh, Patna, uh, Malda, Akola, Mysore, etcetera. So, these are the three categories within domestic airports. The other category is uh, for custom airports. Uh, these are having the international tourist potential and uh, uh, therefore, they have to be slowly and slowly upgraded to that level. We have some examples in this case like uh, the airport being provided at uh, Jaipur, Kalikat, Agra, Gaya, etcetera, they are all custom airports and uh, they are the locations basically of having the tourist potential that is why this is how they have been defined. 
Finally, we come to the uh, other categories of aerodromes in India. Uh, they are the civil enclaves uh, which are at uh, defence airfields and again they may be operational and they may be non-operational uh, in the sense that uh, not many of times even by the defence personnel uh, the flights have been operated by those locations, but then they come under the control of the defence personnel and they are termed as the defence airfields being provided within the country for protecting our boundaries or for protecting uh, providing the uh, space, air space from where the strikes can be done uh, without any uh, chance or uh, with a very small chance of being hit at the same time. So, under the operational categories we have uh, Bagdogra, Leh, etc., which are which can be said that they are uh, very near to the frontier boundaries where there are certain non-operational uh, civil enclaves uh, like uh, Allahabad uh, that comes under the defence uh, category and that is being maintained as a uh, defence runway strip, but is not operational in otherwise sense. And then there are air force aerodromes which are totally under the control of the air force of India and uh, there are sorties being done by the fighter planes from these particular aerodromes and they are not allowing or uh, basically the passenger movements are not allowed from these airports looking at their safety and security concerns and their strategic values. So, that is another category of aerodromes which are there. So, that is how we have classified the airports. So, students in the today's introductory lecture of uh, airports, air transport, what we have seen is that uh, the development of uh, air transport in the world as well as uh, in India. And then we have looked at the some of the important agencies which are working globally or which are working within our country so as to control air navigation and provide the guidelines for their operation. And finally, we looked at uh, the classification of the airports which have been given by the two primary or prime agencies that is ICAO and FAA based on certain criteria and then the way the aerodromes have been classified in our country that is India. Uh, that is where we will be stopping in this lecture and we will be continuing with the other aspects of air transportation in the next lecture. Till then, goodbye and thank you.